بيوس بيوت أمتاي أي حلة لنسى معي But, uh, first with us today we have Dan Connell, um, all the way from America and actually flew here today. So hopefully he's enough for us to hold a talk. He has promised that he will not fall asleep during the talk, at least. And, and Dan Connell, he's a visiting scholar at Boston University African Studies Center and a retired senior lecturer on uh, journalism at Simmons College. And we're very, very thankful for having him here. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I am here to talk about Eritrean refugees and migration, of course, as every day in the newspapers and the television and radio are full of stories about the migrants uh, coming to Europe. The story for some time was of people coming through Libya and across the Mediterranean, and the coverage has, of course, tended to shift toward the Balkans uh, and Central Europe with the flow coming up in that direction. But the flow has not stopped uh, through Libya, and if you've seen uh, any of the recent stories, you will know that most of the people on those boats are from the little country of Eritrea. So I'm going to assume that not everybody is familiar, although I see many Eritreans in the audience, and I hope they will pardon me while I truncate their history into a very brief uh, outline. But I want to just hit on a few things in Eritrea's background so you know something about where the country uh, is coming from and, and get some sense of what is lying behind the flows coming out, which I will talk to about in much more detail when I get to a slideshow. Uh, on my research, which has taken me to 19 countries uh, over the last year to interview refugees about why they left, what happened when they got out, uh, and about their journeys onward from there. So just quick set the scene. Uh, here it is. In America, I always have to start with this. Where is this country? You may already be way ahead of me on that, but just to make it a little simpler. Uh, there is the background. The borders of Eritrea, like the borders of uh, just about every country in Africa, and many in the Middle East for that matter, uh, were set uh, during the colonial era. In Eritrea's case, uh, it was in the 1890s by the Italians uh, who moved in from the coast on the Red Sea. Uh, tried actually to conquer what was then uh, Abyssinia and is now northern Ethiopia, but were stopped at, the, at a river, the Marib River, and the border of Eritrea, the southern border of Eritrea, tracks that, uh, the, the results of that battle. The territory itself uh, is uh, comprised of nine different ethnic groups, uh, with each with distinctive languages, uh, half roughly half Christian, half Muslim, so it's quite diverse uh, internally. Uh, the, but from there, Eritrea takes uh, an unusual uh, track. Uh, it was under three successive uh, outside uh, powers. Italy lost World War II in, uh, in, well, was driven out of Eritrea in the early 40s. Britain took over for 10 years. Uh, it was uh, then, in the early 50s, federated to Ethiopia, which absorbed it in the early 1960s. So it went for uh, half a century uh, under uh, other than Italian rule before it won its independence in the 90s. Protests against Ethiopian, uh, the Ethiopian takeover and suppression of Eritrean uh, rights and, and the, the basics of uh, its national identity uh, were met with violence in the 50s and 60s. A liberation war was launched in 1961 uh, the, under an uh, organization called the Eritrean Liberation Front, which uh, split at the end of that decade really into two new wings, one with the same name, ELF, and another, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. In the midst of a 30-year war for independence, 
with Ethiopia beginning to lose and with Emperor Haile Selassie uh, under assault uh, on many fronts, the military took over in Ethiopia. Uh, and that's about the time that I became involved, in 1976. Uh, the takeover took place in 1974, uh, at the end of an era of war against the Eritrean national struggle that was backed wholly by the United States. In 1976, the uh, new government in Ethiopia switched allegiances to the Soviet Union. The U.S. went out, the Soviet Union came in, and in effect, the Eritreans had a second war for another 15 years. Now, why, why I say all this, you don't have to remember all these details, but the, the, the story here is one of successive betrayals by the international community, uh, the ignoring of Eritrea's uh, aspirations and, and rights repeatedly uh, for strategic reasons, and that really helped shape the personality of a nation, uh, uh, which today exhibits uh, fierce nationalism even among many of those who have left, uh, and also a deep distrust of the international community for promises not kept uh, and for those uh, side switchings that took place, uh, all leading to a kind of go-it-alone uh, approach to their own uh, uh, independence. In the midst of the struggle against these many outside uh, complications, there was a civil war between the two wings of the national movement, the ELF and the EPLF. The EPLF uh, ended up driving the ELF out of the country and becoming the sole uh, military force in the 1980s, uh, and eventually won the war in 1991, and used that opportunity to set up uh, a new government. The country began with great promise. It was a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional uh, nation, where ethnicity and religion played only minor roles uh, in the politics. There was almost no crime, almost no corruption. Ethiopia had assumed all the debt uh, when it let Eritrea go, so it started debt-free uh, and committed toward a form of, uh, of development that would uh, not involve heavy dependence uh, on outside powers. The this was matched by a high level of volunteerism within the society so that many, many Eritreans who had gone into exile during this time came back. But there were exceptions to this because the new government was right from the beginning intolerant of any difference uh, from its own perspective uh, and would not permit any other organizations uh, in the country, including uh, the ELF as an organization and others as well. When People, including veterans of the Liberation Front, tried to start their own NGOs, even daycare centers, child, child care centers, uh, that were outside the control of the ruling party uh, or the state, they were shut down. So there was a very mixed uh, bag, really, in the 1990s. There was a, an attempt to write a constitution that involved large uh, conferences of people uh, in villages throughout the country and, and within the diaspora, talking about the kind of government uh, that they wanted. The Constitution was ratified in 1997, but then the President refused to implement it. So you had promising possibility and warning signs interlaced all the way through that period. Meanwhile, the country went to war with every one of its neighbors over uh, minor border issues, uh, resorting immediately to violence and armed conflict uh, to settle disputes outside, uh, and uh, a similar resort to authoritarianism uh, and repression inside. What you really had here was a liberation movement that had been shaped by 30 years of conflict, uh, had developed a culture of secrecy uh, and, and very centralized control that uh, could not adapt after the transition to governance. And instead, it created a government that mirrored its experience uh, as a liberation front. 
In effect, they turned uh, Eritrea into a large liberated zone under a guerrilla movement commanded by a man named Isaias Afwerki, who had been the military commander of the front and remains today the unelected president of the country. The other thing that uh, is, I think, important to bring out here is that the Eritrea fought a war for its independence against an Ethiopia 20 times its size, backed by successive superpowers, the United States and then the Soviet Union. How does it do that? It did it with a, an extraordinary level of organization and discipline uh, and a strong engagement of the population in the independence war. What we learned later was that this had been guided throughout by a secret uh, party, the Eritrean People's Revolutionary Party, which controlled the EPLF itself from within and managed uh, its daily strategic uh, affairs, set the slates for candidates who would run in Congresses held by the Liberation Front, wrote the programs, and managed the whole process from behind the scenes. Uh, this also, I think, is an important aspect of what came later, because what we have today is a country with a government that has a sort of a set of uh, of institutions that uh, have very little to do with the actual making of decisions and the exercise of power. Power gets exercised from within these by a, a small group of people around the president, maybe in another party, maybe not, hard to know. But it's not in Eritrea as if there's one wing, a National Security Service or the army that's in power. It's the president and a cabal of people around him, which operate through uh, different uh, parts of the, of the state and ruling party apparatus. In 1998, the, the uh, dispute with Ethiopia took Eritrea back into a, a full-scale war, one of the most brutal that had been seen in Africa. Uh, and that really became a kind of turning point for the country. It became the umbrella under which those uh, forces within the government who wanted to move away from uh, a, a democratic transition and back into a much more controlled uh, direction basically performed a coup from the top. And afterward, in 2001, when members of the leadership in the and the ruling party and the state uh, criticized uh, the president, uh, publishing some of their criticisms in the private press. The response of the regime was to arrest the leaders and shut down the press. So 2001 becomes a kind of turning point. And it's really the moment that the outflow of refugees starts to pick up. Several things happen at that point. Uh, all dissent was basically crushed. Dissenters and suspected disloyalty, disloyalists were arrested. Uh, even uh, even the, the religious denominations that were unacceptable to the regime were banned, uh, leaving only a handful that were legal. Whatever the regime couldn't control, uh, it banned. The uh, the other thing that they did was to take a national service program under which Eritreans uh, 17, 18, 19 were uh, conscripted into service for 18 months of military service and then national reconstruction. They extended that indefinitely under a plan called the Warsaw Yikalo campaign. And it was the, the, the combination of that heavy repression uh, and the future that many young people faced of indefinite service uh, at levels of pay that were so low that their parents had to subsidize them in order for them to keep up their work uh, with no uh, likelihood uh, in the near or even midterm future of getting out that pushed so many to leave. The, uh, I 
myself uh, raised criticisms of this in 2001 and 2002 and was ousted from the country, so I have not been back since September of 2002, uh, after many, many years of uh, living there and writing uh, about the country from the inside. My work since 2012 has focused very much on the refugee population. And I was uh, still teaching full-time up until last June, but in 2012, 2013, during my winter break and my summer breaks, uh, I traveled to Ethiopia in 2012 to the refugee camps there, to Israel in January of 2013, uh, to Egypt and Sudan uh, in June of 2013, and then back into the region uh, in 2014 and the first half of this year. And I'm going to take you through some of that in the slides just to show you what it looks like. Uh, just a little bit of nostalgia here. Here's what I looked like when I went into Eritrea in 1977. Um, can we dim the lights a little bit? Or, because I'm going to go for. I think it always helps to see. Can you hear me through this? You can probably hear me without the microphone, actually. Okay. Um, okay. 2012. Uh, Eritreans have been pouring out of the country through the two largest neighbors, uh, Sudan uh, at first and uh, in the last decade or so, Ethiopia. There are in 2012, there were three refugee camps up in the northern area there. This is a rather bad scan of a UNHCR map, but um, it's up there in the top of uh, Ethiopia. There's a cluster of camps there. There's actually a fourth now uh, where uh, refugees uh, kept, are kept. They started really coming across in the early 2000s in large numbers, and the first camp, uh, well, there was one camp that was moved, but the, the oldest camp that's uh, still being used is, uh, uh, is this one, uh, which has a lot of people from the Kunama minority in the west. It's called Shemelva, and if you look at it, you can see it looks a lot like a stable village. Uh, this is after what was then uh, seven or eight years, uh, and it, it had begun to stabilize uh, as a community, but it is in one of the most arid and poor parts of uh, Ethiopia, and it's uh, a kind of uh, dead end for many of the people coming out. Uh, the United Nations uh, World Food Program puts up uh, a lot of the aid. The camps are run by the Ethiopian Refugee Authority. This is what a newer camp looks like. This is a place called Adi Harush. Uh, when people come, they get uh, a camp from UNICEF, I mean a tent rather, from UNICEF to set up. And then from there, they begin to add uh, other building materials to, uh, to build houses. But you can see this is uh, a very difficult and harsh environment, especially for the many young men and women who are coming out of urban areas from uh, uh, conditions much, much different from this. And in this respect, if you're following the news at all about the, the new uh, migrations through the Balkans that involve many middle-class Syrians, something similar was happening here. Uh, the problem uh, in, in they immediately face is the difficulty of adapting to life in these camps. Normally, you look at a refugee camp, if you've seen pictures of it, you see women and children and older people Many of the young men have gone off someplace to work. Here it's flipped, it's almost the opposite. Uh, a very large share, maybe 40% uh, percent, uh, or up to 50% in some of these camps are young men of conscription age between say 17 or 18 and 25. Uh, here they are at uh, the twice daily opportunity to get water. Uh, you just get a sense of uh, who they are. There are also kids there, uh, uh, and families as well. Uh, in some cases, in the uh, older camps, uh, some children who were born there. 
There were also, in 2012, a growing number of unaccompanied minors. Uh, these are boys who came across the border by themselves, uh, either alone or in small groups, but without a, a relative. When I asked them, as I did with the girls, uh, why they came, they were often looking for a sibling or a parent who had come over before uh, and who had moved on. Uh, so they were in a, a, a kind of a quixotic search for family. Uh, and they were also often uh, coming because they heard stories about the abusive uh, uh, treatment of national service conscripts, and particularly among the girls uh, who were uh, afraid of uh, sexual abuse, uh, as well as uh, the other humiliations that often accompanied it. Um, were leaving before they were called in order to get out. Now, I'm going to jump around a little bit time-wise because I want to just give you some contrast. I went back to Ethiopia last June uh, and went up to the same camps. Uh, that last one I was looking at was one called Bayani, which was the, uh, the sort of hub of a lot of economic and social activity among those camps. I found this when I got back and it really seemed to uh, capture the spirit of many of the people who were there. Uh, three years later than that earlier trip, 2015, uh, many of the people I had met before were gone. They had gone to Libya, and they may well be uh, here. Um, many of those who remained behind were discouraged about their future uh, and didn't see uh, any opportunities uh, waiting them in the camps themselves. There were some who had started up small businesses uh, and had taken other kinds of initiatives. There was a school there functioning for young children, which was uh, working quite well. But beyond that, there's very little work there uh, and very little future. This looks very much like the other scene did uh, three years earlier. Uh, you'll see, if anything, uh, the, the ages are starting to go down. If you look out at the sports fields, you'll see a lot of younger children who were 14, 15 out here playing. There were not so many at that time. There were uh, hundreds and hundreds, actually, of very young people, sometimes 10 uh, or 12, who were coming across the border. Uh, and, and what was uh, a worrying trend uh, and I think they're seeing the other end of that here in Sweden with a growing number of unaccompanied minors. Um, but these are like tribes of kids who are now coming out. Uh, the, the, the difficulty here is that many times they have no idea what awaits them, but once they're out, they're afraid to go back. Uh, and parenthetically, I would say the International Committee for the Red Cross is now looking at the possibility of helping some of the very young ones to repatriate question still is what happens when they get back. Um, just a few quick images of the latest camp to be set up in a place called Hitzatz. Uh, it's in uh, a low, lower area than the other ones we were looking at, therefore hotter uh, and, and harsher to live in. Again, many, many children coming in. Everywhere I went, uh, I'm with an American researcher, you can see her in the back. Um, but there were busloads coming in uh, every few days with new refugees. They come across the border, uh, they encounter villagers who take them to local military posts. The Ethiopian military takes them to a reception center where they're registered. So almost all the refugees who come into Ethiopia are registered. I also was in Sudan uh, last May. Uh, as I had been before. Sudan is very difficult to take photographs in. I was given a permit to take photographs of monuments. So I don't have any here, and I'm not going to bore you with monuments, although there's some amazing monuments in Sudan. But what you, what you see there is uh, a flow of people that's a little more underground. The UN uh, in Sudan estimates uh, that some as many as two to 3,000 a month have been coming into Sudan, and they thought they were only getting about 40% of them uh, to register, so there are that many more. If you just stop for a second and think about this, 
This is a small country. The population is variously estimated at anywhere from 4 million to 6 million. It's hard to know what it is because they haven't had a census, uh, and there's no real way to confirm numbers coming out of Eritrea on almost anything. But let's say there are 5 million people in Eritrea. The UN has said that some 300 and I think there are up to 30,000 refugees have been counted leaving in recent years. Assume they're undercounting because they are not getting many of those coming through Sudan. So maybe we're talking about 500,000 who have come out at a fairly conservative estimate. That's 10% of the population has left. This is not a country at war like Afghanistan uh, or uh, Iraq or Syria. It's a country uh, with people fleeing largely because of the repression that they face and the sense of hopelessness they have within the country. A quick trip to the eastern part of uh, Ethiopia. This is the road to, that goes to the little country of Djibouti uh, that is, sits at the entrance to the Red Sea, former French uh, colony, uh, now independent, but they also have a French military base and a US military base. Um, but the most important aspect of Djibouti is that it is the main uh, trade uh, port of entry for Ethiopia. Uh, since uh, ports in Eritrea, which Ethiopia used to use, are now closed to it. So the traffic is enormous. But there is also a large minority of Eritreans uh, in the southeastern part of the country. Afar, ethnically Afar, uh, Muslim, who have uh, really had a very different experience than the Eritreans uh, in the highlands. Similar problems with political repression uh, and uh, conscription into the national service, but added on to that is a level of cultural discrimination and exclusion uh, that uh, infuses their lives. Many Afars have left their territory to go to Djibouti or to uh, Eastern Ethiopia. Uh, and have done so with their whole families. So the refugee populations in uh, the camp, for example, that I visited uh, in Asaita, uh, include the more traditional makeup of a refugee camp, of uh, whole families with women, children, husbands, uh, grandparents, uh, extended families, and so on. More stable uh, populations, less likely to migrate onward. And also, uh, out of sight of much of the international community with very few services uh, there. Uh, I only add this in to show you that the situation uh, in the region itself is complex and reflects the complexity of Eritrea's uh, society, which is only going to get more divided as people move out into uh, separate areas uh, and communities. This is what the camp looked like close up. Uh, it's an even harsher environment. I, you notice the sky in the background, by the way, is uh, hazy. There is a wind blowing that has so much sand and dust in it that uh, it can be difficult to uh, really to stand and breathe without uh, covering your mouth. It's that time of the year there. Um, when I was there, there were also people looking up at a posting of people uh, scheduled for the second round of interviews for resettlement. Uh, and for many people, this is the only hope they have uh, within these camps because there is, once again, and especially in these Afar camps, very little training uh, or uh, options for school and no jobs, except for maybe half a dozen jobs in the school and the clinic. So their future is quite bleak, which is why many move on. Uh, quick trip through some of the places they've moved on to. Uh, some uh, time ago, maybe over the last two years, there was more coverage of the problem in the Sinai uh, that some of you may be aware of. I uh, learned about this in 2011 and 12, uh, that Eritreans who were uh, then leaving through Sudan 
and trying to go through uh, Libya or north, uh, were being turned back from Libya and they were shifting in direction uh, toward Egypt and Israel. They were also paying smugglers from a small uh, ethnic minority called the Rashida, who live in uh, eastern Sudan uh, and western Eritrea, to get them there. Somewhere along 2009 or 10, some of these smugglers uh, realized that they could get additional money by holding on to the, uh, the, their passengers and ransoming them. By 2010, 2011, it became a very lucrative business. Uh, and as uh, the flow of refugees voluntarily taking that route began to slow down, particularly after 2012, where Israel, when Israel built the fence. Um, the Bedouin traffickers began kidnapping Eritreans inside Sudan and the refugee camps and taking them uh, to Sinai, where they were kept on torture farms uh, and forced to call relatives to beg for money. I went to interview survivors in Israel and to see what their conditions were like. And in 2013, I found this, these, uh, a very vibrant community, actually, in the heart of South Tel Aviv, uh, where many Israelis were responding by trying to help. The community, uh, the municipality had set up tents for some homeless. Uh, there was a, 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 an NGO that was uh, doing a, a kind of soup kitchen uh, food distribution every night. Uh, there were some artists and writers who had set up a library for the refugees. Uh, and by this time, there were 35,000 uh, in Israel, making Eritreans one of the largest non-Arab minorities in the country. There was also a big backlash developing at this time among uh, ethnic nationalists within Israel who wanted the Africans out, all of them, without regard to where they came from. Uh, and life was becoming increasingly difficult. In fact, by 2012, there had been a series of violent incidents and fire bombings uh, aimed at refugees to try to drive them to leave. When I was there, I witnessed a very large demonstration by right-wing nationalists uh, not very far away from that park that I showed you before, arguing that the refugees were polluting uh, Jewish society uh, and should be driven out. You can see that image of a time bomb there uh, in the middle. It's the argument that has been used uh, in other situations uh, to say that there's a demographic time bomb uh, in Israel with the uh, continuing immigration of refugees. By 2013, the backlash, though, had been picked up by the government, which had already started to implement measures to end the influx uh, of refugees. I'm happy at least to put this out to say that Israeli society is also complicated and there were uh, many Israelis uh, who were resisting this, these policies, but they were not successful. I went uh, down to the border uh, after that to the Saharanim prison where some of the incoming would-be asylum seekers were kept. Uh, they are incidentally not called refugees in Israel, they're called infiltrators, which puts them in a category that is uh, uh, under uh, 1954 law against infiltrators that was designed to keep terrorists from getting into Israel. So they manage the language of this uh, also quite effectively. They don't even call them migrants. Um, this is a fence that Hungary can only be jealous of. It is uh, one that runs from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. It has electronic sensors on it. People don't get through. So at the end of 2012, they basically stopped the inflow. Handfuls of people would sometimes get in. The uh, Israeli military might let them uh, get through. But by and large, they kept them out. This, however, didn't end the, the uh, torture and ransom campaigns that were going on on the other side of the border. And while I was in Israel, I talked with quite a number of uh, torture victims, including one young man 
uh, who uh, had been a computer programmer who had been hung by his hands uh, and had uh, been beaten and tortured while forced to get on a cell phone to call his family. I won't bring her on the picture, but there were people that were having plastic bags melted and dripped on them. Uh, there were people who were badly beaten, uh, sometimes for months on end, to get as much as 30, 40, even 50,000 US dollars from people coming from uh, families that could never afford that. What had to happen was that when uh, families uh, attempted to rescue uh, members, they would have to reach out to their churches and their uh, wider communities, to diaspora uh, Eritreans who might be here, might be in the US, might be somewhere else, uh, who would be sending money back to try to save uh, a family member. And in that way, the community really tried to take care of its own. <clears throat> Uh, but it was uh, a, a never-ending struggle because the business became so lucrative that like the, uh, the problem we have with uh, drug smuggling in many parts of the world, particularly in the, uh, the Americas, uh, it, the money itself has a corrupting influence on the authorities in all the countries where it takes place, so it's very difficult to crack down on. I went after this to Egypt to go into the Sinai uh, uh, to see for myself uh, what was going on and how people were coping with it. And I was taken in with a man named uh, Sheikh Mohammed, who is from the Bedouin community there, but strongly opposes the trafficking, uh, calling it uh, against Islam uh, and organizing in his mosque to oppose it. I was there the day after he and a group of uh, friends and family had gone into a compound, a torture compound, and rescued a group of Eritreans. They had also filmed it on their iPad, this being uh, the modern world. So I sat and watched the film of it. I'm, I'm not going to run through that, but the next day I was taken to, uh, uh, to the place where the victims were being uh, kept and protected. The guy that I just showed you is protecting them. Uh, there were uh, several women who had been abused repeatedly uh, for uh, as long as five months during that time. Uh, a young man who had been beaten with a chain. Another who had not been able to raise money from his family, so they just stopped feeding him. Uh, I'm happy to say he is in fine shape now. Uh, I, I, have uh, followed this afterward. There is an Eritrean woman who lives in Milan, uh, known as Dr. Al Ganesh, uh, who has been doing uh, quiet work for many, many years to help these torture victims get out. Uh, and she was there uh, with me, taking photographs, taking biographical information, running back to Cairo, to the UN, to give them the information so that the people could get papers in order to get out uh, of the Sinai. Because once they were rescued, if they started to move through the Sinai without papers and they're caught by the Egyptians, they could get arrested, jailed, and then sent back to Eritrea. Uh, extraordinary. That's uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Alganesh on the far right, and that's uh, Sheikh Mohammed in the middle. And I'm taking the picture. Okay, back to Israel. I went back again this January. Remember that park where I showed you those big tents? Tents are all gone. There are no newcomers. And Israel has begun arresting, uh, or detaining, they don't call it arrest, detaining Eritreans who had come uh, before 2009 uh, and putting them in a detention center right down in the Negev uh, desert on the border. Uh, and making their lives extremely difficult uh, as a way of pressuring them to self-deport. Now, there has been a lot of legal battles, so the current situation uh, is uh, in flux, and some of the people who have been detained have been released, but the government's plan is to try to move as many as they can into conditions that will uh, convince them to leave. They were, at the time I was there, giving them $3,500 uh, US dollars 
uh, to do so, to either go back to Eritrea or to go to Uganda or Rwanda. It's a form of uh, sort of high pressure ethnic cleansing without the violence that we often associate with it. But it was taking the guts out of the Eritrean community because if you take those who have been there the longest, you're taking those who speak Hebrew, who know the society, who have jobs, and who hold the, uh, the, the community together. So the situation in uh, Israel was becoming very discouraging, and all the refugees that I spoke with were trying to find ways to get out and to come here. Um, I also, in uh, that trip, went down to the Holot uh, Detention Center, which is an odd sort of mix between a halfway house and a prison. Uh, people are detained overnight inside, but they can go out for short breaks during the day as long as they check in. So they came out, met with me, and I interviewed them outside. Right across from there is the prison. Anybody uh, who makes trouble in uh, the detention center gets moved to the prison, uh, as happened to dozens who were involved in a protest uh, at one point when they tried to pack up their goods and just walk across the border to Egypt and leave. I think in its own way, one of the more disturbing things that I saw on that trip, though, was this back near uh, Levinsky Square in South Tel Aviv. This is a, a stencil, uh, Ausländer Raus. If you know German, this is a slogan from the 30s. It's foreigners out. To have that being turned now onto the migrants uh, is an extremely disturbing development, a kind of neo-Nazism from within the more extreme elements of the Jewish community. Um, how am I doing? Eight o'clock. I have one last uh, segment of slides. Um, I, I, I just want to say that in between these trips, in, in January was Israel, in February and March I was in Kenya and South Africa, which are, have been for a long time also destinations within Africa for Eritreans. The, there's a significant uh, community in South Africa. In each of those countries, too, the refugees are meeting resistance uh, and, uh, and more problems. Uh, in Kenya, the, uh, the attacks on Kenya by, uh, by al-Shabaab from Somalia has caused a tremendous uh, uh, response against the Somali community. And Eritreans often get sort of picked up in that, uh, in, in Kenyan, wider Kenyan society and also in government policy. Um, part of that has to do with the history of an association between the Eritrean government and support for uh, Somali rebel groups, but part of it is just a, a, a broad kind of uh, backlash against people from, from the Horn and refugees uh, coming up within Kenya. South Africa, there's been uh, repeated rounds of what is called their xenophobic violence, if you've heard about this, where the influx of refugees, especially large numbers from uh, Zimbabwe, as well as Somalis, Eritreans, and others, uh, has caused uh, attacks uh, on perceived foreigners uh, by black South Africans against outsiders. So there aren't so safe places in many places where you think there might be, which helps to explain why people take such risks to cross the Mediterranean and the boats. You all know about that. I, I'm not going to go through pictures of that, I'm sure. But now, most recently, the trek through the Balkans, uh, which, incidentally, I, I'm familiar with already because I've talked to Eritreans who have been making that trek for the, the last several years. But one that you may not know as much about is the Americas. There are, have been hundreds of Eritreans who have uh, paid smugglers to get them to South America uh, and then to go overland from there up through Central America into the United States. So we in the U.S. are, are seeing the coverage of the uh, immigration coming across the southern border and identifying it as largely poor Central Americans, economic migrants. But within that flow, there are hundreds of Eritreans, also some Somalis, 
uh, and, and other Africans. The route to get there, uh, there are several, actually, uh, bizarre routes. Uh, I've talked to people who have gone from you know, Nairobi, Kenya, to Dubai, where the headquarters of many of the smuggling rings uh, is, and from there to Moscow, and then Havana, and then Quito, Ecuador, and then overland. Why that way? It's because Aeroflot is a cheap airline to fly, in part. Uh, but there's also been people who have gone to Turkey uh, and, and back to South America, sometimes to Brazil, uh, and then up. I have talked to a number who gave me uh, detailed maps of their own routes, and so in March uh, I followed that. I went first to Quito, Ecuador, where many go. When they land in Ecuador, they often get there with uh, false papers identifying them as Ethiopian migrant workers. The smugglers take those papers uh, and destroy them, and from there on, they're on their own, uh, traveling with help of smugglers, but with no papers. So they run the risk of being uh, imprisoned along the way, attacked by uh, drug smugglers uh, and other gangs uh, in areas that are extremely dangerous, much like the dangers that Eritreans face going across the Sahara uh, and, and later uh, in the Mediterranean. This is a small hotel where uh, many stayed when they were in Quito. Nothing much to see there. The, I, I didn't take the overland trip from there. I uh, flew to Panama and then I picked up a bus there. But many of the Eritreans from Quito go by bus up toward the Colombian border. They get out before the border. They walk around through the jungle. They get back on. They go through Colombia considerable risk. You get to northern Colombia, and I don't know how many of you know this, but there is no road connecting North and South America. There is a strip of wilderness uh, in the border, the, well, it's actually what would be the western edge of uh, Panama, known as the Darien Gap. And there's no road through it. You have to take a ferry to get around that. Some Eritreans have gone overland through that uh, and it is really difficult. There are uh, dangerous animals, insects, trees, uh, gangs of smugglers, uh, uh, counterinsurgency forces of the Panamanian security looking for the drug smugglers. If, you, if you're going that route, the most common thing is to hop in a boat, overcrowded just like the ones in the Mediterranean and go to a point in the wilderness on the Panama border and then go inland from there. Um, and, and to travel sometimes along one of these rivers. The smugglers hire indigenous people to take them in canoes and one of my enterprising uh, informants, uh, many of these Eritreans are young, you know the smugglers take all their papers but they scan them on their phones. So they have the records of this, which is how I knew where they, where they had been. Uh, this is a photograph one of them took of a boat that I think had 70 people in it. So this would be about, I don't know, halfway up in it. Uh, just to say that traveling by crowded boat has become part of the Eritrean experience in whatever part of the world you're in. Uh, and th there are cohorts that move through the jungles camp out in the jungle together, and then end up in uh, the edge of the Darien Gap, the forest there, uh, where they run into Panama, Panamanian soldiers, and they get detained. They often get passed through two, three, sometimes four different camps before they get to Panama City, where they go to the authorities, register, make their case for temporary papers, usually get them, uh, and then continue on. But all along the way, they have to worry about being robbed uh, or cheated. Uh, many, hardly anybody speaks Spanish in, in, in these groups. Uh, so they don't carry any money with them either. They have to find uh, a, a place where they can call a relative and get money wired uh, all along the way. Again, you're seeing uh, mostly young men, although there are also young women and some children who make this route. 
This is the poor part of Panama City, uh, where they stay in a rundown hotel here, uh, and then get on these colorful buses. They're often called chicken buses because there are chickens and goats up in the luggage racks. Uh, and again, they go uh, through the country to the border, get out of the border, before the border, walk around, sometimes get put in the backs of pickup trucks driving along highways at night to escape detection, uh, but often, uh, again, taking enormous risks to get through Central America, which is a very dangerous place right now. They get to Mexico, finally, and they're detained again. But this time it's a relief, at least to the ones that I talked to. I talked to a group of Eritreans and also to some Somalis uh, here in Tapachula, which is a town on the western side of the Mexican border near the Pacific Ocean through which the Pan American Highway runs. They get detained. The Mexican authorities, who have a fairly generous asylum policy, interview them, vet them to decide are they legitimate, what's their story, where are they headed. If they are convincing, as they, they usually are, within a week they're given a 30-day pass to go through Mexico. And they go from there out to this hotel, the uh, uh, Palafox, um, where everybody seems to say they're now legal in Mexico. They have papers so they can move around. Right across the street is an internet cafe, which is all they need. And they go from there up to the Mexican uh, border with the United States. I flew up there, crossed over into Mexico, and I walked across the border myself, uh, passing uh, at least one Eritrean who was being coached by a, a smuggler on what to say at the other end. When they get to the border, they announce themselves, I'm from Eritrea, here's why I'm here. They get detained again. Um, if they can make a compelling case in a hearing there, and they have a relative who will sponsor them, they can be released uh, uh, on probation. Uh, otherwise, they may stay in detention in the US after all that. Um, that has become the experience that bridge, by the way, anybody can just walk onto. It's getting off it at the other end in the U.S. that's the challenge. Um, there was a big line of people. I didn't stop to talk to the Eritrean because I didn't want to panic her uh, in the middle of that situation. So that's the end. Um, I have been writing about this in articles for a variety of outlets. I post those articles uh, up on my website, so if you're interested in reading more, that's where you'll find it. So let me just, let's see, I'm sorry, I, I can be encyclopedic on this and I don't want to do that, I want to save some time for questions, but let me just say a few quick things in conclusion. Um, there are, are, there's a global migration crisis, we're all increasingly aware of this. The Eritreans are playing a big uh, role in this uh, after the Iraqis, uh, Afghanis, uh, Syrians. Uh, they are one of the largest groups, and one of the largest uh, in uh, Sweden and Norway, uh, also in Germany. Um, they, they're showing up in North America, in uh, Australia, all over the world. Um, all countries with developed economies, internal stability, and rights-based societies, which is, in my uh, experience of interviewing people, uh, easily as big a draw as any economic incentives uh, that we often read about uh, and hear about. It's, it's freedom, freedom from fear, that is often one of the driving forces that gets people to take the risks uh, that I've just been outlining. There's also a crisis now developing within Eritrea itself with so many people leaving. The military has been degraded by the outflow of uh, young people from its uh, forces, uh, as has the workforce. So the Eritrean government has been making increasing overtures, particularly in Europe, uh, to re-engage, to try to curb the outflow of people from the country and, and uh, to encourage uh, countries, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, but also in North America and elsewhere, uh, to send people back. 
Now, the key question here is, has anything changed in the situation that has driven them out? And I think uh, that's a, a, a big one uh, to keep taking a hard look at. Two very important reports uh, that were issued in June, one by the uh, Commission of Inquiry of the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, the other by the uh, European uh, support, uh, uh, Asylum Support Office, much less well known, but extremely well documented, suggests that uh, things have not yet changed. And my uh, interviews with more than 400 uh, refugees, many of them recent arrivals, uh, suggests uh, little has changed either. There are pledges of change in the national service regime. Uh, that may uh, come up, it may not. It may not be enough either. Uh, but just to step back for a second, whatever one thinks about the situation there, there is now a moment of political interest in dealing with the refugee situation here and elsewhere where the refugees are going, and also at the source of at least one of the flows in Eritrea. Uh, that offers at least an opportunity to look at what could be done uh, to, uh, to curb it. What mainly propels the secondary migration uh, once refugees leave Eritrea are insecurity and fear, especially for Christian Highlanders in the Islamic uh, countries of Sudan and Djibouti. The absence of compelling opportunities for education and income in neighboring states and the lack of confidence many, many young people feel in the possibility of durable change in the near term within Eritrea. To slow the exodus from the country, the most important changes are obviously ones that need to be made at the source within Eritrea. Starting with the official end to what's been called the Warsaw Yikalo campaign that extended national service indefinitely back in 2002. Coupled with that, uh, international support for a phased demobilization of conscripts in service more than 18 years, 18 months already, uh, uh, could contribute to some stability, as could aid for resuscitating the economy, upgrading the schools, uh, and so on, if carefully monitored. But Eritrea doesn't publish a national budget, so it's very difficult to know where money goes and what it's being spent on. Without that, I would suggest that all these initiatives run the risk of uh, propping up the worst aspects of the current regime rather than fostering change. What else is needed is the release of those imprisoned for trying to flee, which number in the many thousands, along with other political prisoners, uh, and the implementation of the 1997 Constitution or some other credible moves toward a rule of law, without which uh, any other small changes in policy or program are likely to be band-aids that can be rescinded at will. Meanwhile, there are some very important things that can be done near the source in the surrounding countries. Uh, and with the increasing uh, willingness and necessity uh, of spending money to deal with refugees who arrive, some of that could be spent constructively uh, in the region, in Sudan, uh, in Ethiopia and in Djibouti. The number one issue in the uh, experience that I observed was security in the camps and in their surroundings, it's security against attack, uh, kidnappings, and so on, increased services in the camps to accommodate the influx, particularly unaccompanied minors. Number three, uh, Ethiopia has something called an out of camps policy where Eritreans who can show that they can be supported by family or some other means are allowed to leave the refugee camps and go into the cities and towns. Though that policy needs to be expanded and subsidized by donor countries, uh, and it needs to be replicated in Sudan uh, and Djibouti. Otherwise, these largely urban refugees are just going to keep coming. Uh, and as, as well, one would expect they should. The, uh, coupled with that, there needs to be much more uh, refugee status determination, or <clears throat> RSD as it's called, in these border countries so that people have a credible opportunity to get resettlement in Europe, 
uh, North America, Australia, uh, and other places, and therefore wait without risking their lives in these many other very dangerous routes out. Um, there are a couple more specifics, but I think that this will just take more time. So I'd rather just cut it at that point and say, there are many, many concrete things that can be done uh, to protect uh, the people who have already left, uh, and there is an opportunity, I think, to take advantage of them to put pressure uh, on the situation at the source to try to bring about change. And I hope that we'll also be talking about that in the coming months, and not just how to build bigger fences at our borders. Thank you very much. And by that, we open up the floor for questions. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll walk around with the microphone.
uh, a tightly controlled uh, military organization uh, with a secretive core that made the decisions, uh, and that that uh, pattern has really never stopped uh, and it continues today. Um, it's not the only liberation movement which has had difficulty with the transition from being a military organization to a, uh, a post-war uh, democratic one. Um, you see tendencies toward that in many other countries that have gone through the same thing, and it's a, a big uh, red flag, so to speak, that uh, the most important moves uh, to laying the groundwork for a democracy, uh, if there is to be one, uh, come right at the moment uh, of transition. And any that are postponed uh, in the name of getting to a certain level of economic development or stability uh, usually are uh, masks for perpetuating uh, the old culture. So. Yes? Yeah, uh, thank you for the, an honest answer, actually, because uh, uh, Many of you guys, way back in the 70s, 80s, like uh, Bill Davis and Leonel Sleep, really popularized this, uh, this uh, and romanticized to some extent uh, the, the Liberation Front. Uh, but uh, it's the same organization that rules today, that was ruling then. But nonetheless, uh, you have contributed a lot to the, to the success of the Front as well, so not being able to go to the country since 2002 is really terrible. But if some consternation to you, there are some of us who have not been there for much longer time. <laughs> but we live in a democratic country, so it's okay. I have, I have written on this issue sometime in 2007. I'm not a politician, but I write now and an article on, a debate article on Articom, which I call a, a nation of fleeing masses. This is in 2000, 2007. And I, I always wonder about a, a double-edged paradox of uh, the Eritrean refugees. On the one hand, uh, many of uh, the refugees who are, the, or former refugees, shall I say, in the diaspora, many, the majority of them still support the government in Eritrea. They live in democratic countries, in particularly the second generation. Youth are, uh, they are not here today, but they usually have been, <laughs> they have been giving you hard time as well, I guess, yeah. in, some, in some of the meetings. And uh, this is one of the paradoxes. I can, uh, the other paradox, which is also very strange, is people who have been living in, for years in, in military train, uh, training and who are, who are capable of defending themselves, who are trained in the art of war, throw their weapons and uh, run away to the, instead of uh, fighting back for their rights. And this is in a country which is based on, on martyrdom and resilience. And how do you explain this paradox? I know. <laughs> It's a tough one, um, but uh, one that I puzzle over as well. Why do so many people vote with their feet by leaving instead of standing up to this? Why are there not more uh, active protests? Um, I, I, I think the, the two most important factors here are that the regime has, and, and the circumstances of Eritrea's experience have really inculcated a level of fear uh, of rising up, uh, sometimes uh, in, in a kind of manner that uh, uh, reminds me at times of Pinochet's Chile, of the arrest, uh, detention, uh, torture, and other abuse of individuals in enough different circumstances for reasons that are sometimes very difficult to understand, that the whole society gets afraid that anybody may be listening and watching and it could happen to you. The thing that is so distinctive is that the rules are not published anywhere. Everybody kind of knows or think they know, but then you may take an extra step to be a little more careful so people are more afraid to talk to somebody than they might be because you just don't know. So that, uh, that, that infusion of fear is one. I think the stripping of hope is the other, that uh, people have you've seen this, have struggled for 30 years, uh, more than 30 years, if you go back to the years of struggling in the United Nations to get recognition as a people, uh, the protests in the streets of Asmara in the 1950s, 
then 30 years of armed struggle having to fight one superpower and all of its allies, and then the next thing you know, you're fighting another superpower and its allies, some of whom have been your friends just a year before. And then finally, when you get to the end of that, you win, you put the flag up, and you're at odds with your own government. And what do you do at that point after so many disappointments? I think that what compels people to rise up and protest is not suffering and bad conditions, it's hope. It's hope for something better. And I think that what's really missing in this is a sense of what else can there be? And the fear, as you well know, that is used by the regime, that any uh, weakening opens the door for Ethiopia to come back in and uh, take, take over, which I frankly don't think is uh, remotely likely. The Ethiopians don't want that much of a headache. Um, but hope is uh, just as important as fear, I think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a little comment only before I give it. Okay. Uh, the, the, you said there is no war in Eritrea, but there is actually a war. The war is it's declared a, by the government on its own yeah. people. No, there's That's certainly... A little correction. Well, I, I, I would just add quickly that I have talked with dozens and dozens of conscripts who have been imprisoned for trying to escape, for being suspected of trying to escape, for being suspected of thinking about talking to somebody else. I mean, you just wouldn't believe all the different things. For praying uh, in, in, uh, while in service, for being members of banned churches. Uh, there's a whole host of things that can get you jailed and thrown into prisons. Many of the prisons are underground with sometimes three, four, five hundred people kept in the dark for months. The uh, torture and abuse can involve taking people in their military units and tying them up with their hands and feet behind their backs in 35 and 40 degree temperatures and left out in the sun, sometimes for days at a time. Uh, there is a chronic culture of violence that has come into the, the military and security forces and there's no accountability for it. There is no place you can go to get a hearing to say, I was mistreated. And in fact, if you raise a question like that, as I heard many people describe, you get punished again. So in, in circumstances like that, where you don't see any individual redress, you head for the door. Um, I think here that uh, the situation will change in Eritrea when Eritreans do come together to bring about a change. I think that also has to be accompanied by a vision, a compelling, convincing vision that things can be better, that's demonstrated by people working together across political lines, healing the wounds. I, I would like to see former leaders of the liberation movement stand up in front of a group like this and say, I also made a mistake like what you were asking me to do. <laughs> because everybody in this history has some blood on their hands but we have to somehow get past that to see uh, change. And I think, just for all of you uh, outside the Eritrean community, I've asked many, many of the people I've interviewed, would you go home? People don't say yes if I had a job. They say, if I had freedom, I would go back home. If there were a change in the government. Uh, it's really uh, not just about economics here. It's really about uh, freedom. If they did, many would go back. Not all, I mean, the further you're away and the longer you stay away, the harder it is. But Eritreans uh, are still very tied to their homeland and many would, if not go back to live, at least go back regularly to contribute to the reconstruction of the country. And I think it has the potential to be, as I have long thought, a model of a multi-ethnic, multi, -ethnic, multi uh, cultural, multi-confessional society uh, that could really pull itself up by its very tattered bootstraps uh, and make a big difference in the region. So I'm going to kind of wrap it up on that because I think we're at the end. And I'm happy to stick around if anybody else has questions, but I know some of you need to get going. I think we have just one last short question. OK. okay. Uh, welcome, Mr. Duncanel. Uh, and thank you. You fight for the Eritrean freedom. You were in Sahel with EPLF. Even though, as my friend,
friend, so you were one-sided man. I don't care now. You are fighting for freedom. You, you fought for freedom, and you are fighting for the Eritrean people's liberation. I think so. And um, this problem you saw us is very tragic. I am very, very less sorry or sad. But I want to ask you one question. This brutal dictator is as a forky. You know him since his 70s. And uh, this, this happened in Eritrea. It happened when he was in Grilla. Do you think that the system if, of EPLF changed now? Or do you believe that it was the same system before the Eritrean freedom? No, I so think many people say yeah. it has changed after 1997-98. But so many people, me too, this system is continuing since 1973. You know about the group of Manka, you know about the group of Yemin, you know about the doctor of Yo. So many intellectuals. So many innocent Tagadanti died underground in Sahel. I think you know about this. So for me, it is the same system is continuing from 1973 up to now. What is your judgment? I, th I think, I'm sorry to say, I, I've already really been talking about exactly that. Um, the roots go back to that time, uh, and they have continued. I, I, I think that if I can add a couple of small things to it that I was just getting at there, I, I, I think um, the movements of that era were almost all highly centralized. They were all patterned on a particular model of national liberation. Uh, the, the ELF at one point had talked about wiping out the EPLF. The EPLF ended up wiping out the ELF. I, I think that you can find uh, it, uh, uh, the roots of problems deeply embedded in the wider culture as well as in the particular history of the EPLF. I mean, there are a lot of things one could talk about here. Uh, Isaias, the man who's the leader, uh, was trained in China in 1968, the height of the Cultural Revolution, very influenced by that too. There, there's a lot of things to break down there, but there's also a wider pattern here. And I think the key questions for us are, how do you perceive these kinds of things developing as they're happening anywhere? And what do you do to heal a society when it has these kinds of wounds deeply embedded in it uh, in such a way that uh, it can knit itself back together again there and attract people to come back from all of its uh, different uh, wings in the diaspora? The key to that clearly is to build an inclusive uh, identity uh, within the country. Uh, and I think that um, some of that can happen inside, some of that has to also happen constructively outside among Eritreans who are outside. And I would really urge those people who are not Eritrean in the room to take this as an invitation to get to know one. Find out a little bit more. They have, I mean, an extraordinarily complex, deep, and rich uh, history, and enormous potential to make contributions uh, to Swedish society as well as to their own. So uh, take advantage of the opportunity that you have with them here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Nakanel, for a very interesting lecture. We'd like to, pre to present you with the, the latest edition of our own newspaper right. from a journalist to a journalist. Here you go. Thank you very much for being with us. كل حالة فايلة تميتة سدر غشة وحيش تميتة تصحر على قوت تصفى نزح مقوان كحلفة تصحر على قوت عمي قال سيس منا برتين أكاديمي نجيزي قوان تحيلني سعر عمري سعر سقبي Fishta 
عملي يدعم حساب في الشغطة عملي في الشغطة عملي عقل الهم كساب سمر لي في الشغطة عملي سعر مبرعي سعر النمسقمي نبرا كبير من نمار ركو تعنا زي بلو مسرقفو هتصينا نعيا وعلي نفسي الرقا بي ايو منفسي لك وعب مبرعي كوكون عددي تتصباي كوكون تمتواتي تعنا يغلعان مستاتفا امرار مركي واتكس النفا واني النقو امينة زحاسكو وحي زيسا مسكينة في الشغطة عملة كل تيرة في الشغطة عملة في الشغطة عملة يدعم يحسن في الشغطة عملة في الشغطة عملة عيح للين كساب سيسمر اللي في الشغطة عملة سعر مبرعي سعر النفس أدمي سنسكي حقو سعر قس يحيال زواه لي لبام يا أخلي من نبال زفل لتوحبتا كبه حال السميع 